So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the afternoon session. Great pleasure to have you again here in the room. As you can see, Minister Siharto, he is on the way from the airport, so he will join us in a few minutes. But I think we should start because uh, time is running out and it's most interesting to hear the points of view of our colleagues. So, with you, I would like to welcome the ministers here on the podium. Mr. Notis Mitraki, the Minister for Migration and Asylum in Greece, as well as Mr. Selmo Tsikotic, Minister for Security in Bosnia-Herzegovina. Welcome, gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to discuss with you this afternoon um, in the context of migration partnership. But before starting with that, I think it would be most interesting for us. Minister Siarto is just arriving, but he gets his microphone. So, I think uh, starting would be good to look what is the situation today. We have heard uh, in Greece for a long time uh, the degrees of arrivals, especially irregular migration, decreased a lot. And then we have now the news that on the Western Balkan routes we have an increase, an increase of at about 100% comparing the last year. So something is happening. But to get a little bit uh, an overview, maybe I would like to start with you, Minister Mitaraki. What is the situation at the moment in Greece and what do you expect for the next month? Please, Your Excellency. Thank you so much. And also I would like to note that it's a privilege for Greece to now become the 19th member of ICMPD. And I thank all the members for uh, supporting the candidacy of Greece. Now, on the issue of migration, clearly 2021 has been a better year compared to the past. We have been a main gateway to Europe since 2015, and we have had difficult years of arrivals that, in the case of 2015, as you know, was one million people that came to the European Union through Greece. We have clearly said that we don't want to be a gateway to the European Union for smuggling networks. We believe in migration, we believe that migration should be encouraged in a legal way. For example, Greece has now offered safe harbor to 700 people from Afghanistan, 100 female dignitaries, members of parliament, judges, uh, lawyers that need international protection, and we participated in such a humanitarian corridor. And I think Europe can do and should do, do more in fostering partnerships with countries of origin and countries of transit. And like the commissioner from the African Union said in her very interesting intervention, we should allow people to come to the European Union. But they should come with rules. They shouldn't come through smuggling networks. And it's very important, and I value very much our cooperation with our good friends uh, from Turkey. It is very critical that the EU-Turkey joint statement works. And I would echo what His Excellency, the Ambassador of Turkey, said before. It has to work both ways. So I've said many times, and I've said that also at the Council of the European Union, that we should anticipate Turkey to fulfill its obligation from the statement, but at the same time, it's absolutely critical that the European Union also does what it has signed to do, the obligation it has towards Turkey from this agreement. Now, the big challenge for the countries of the Balkan route are secondary flows. And secondary flows are arising from two areas. They're arising from the fact that we have had substantial primary flows. And they also arise from the fact that the European Union does not provide a common protection space. It means that although we're talking about a European pact on migration and asylum, we talk about European agencies, we talk about European regulations, we th still talk about national responsibility for providing uh, safe harbor, providing home for people entitled to international protection. And given the fact that Europe has substantial social imbalances, it has substantial imbalances in the benefit system, for example, among member states, and that does drive secondary flow, this is what caused secondary flows to happen. I should say in the case of Greece that we're, we're a strong opponent of irregular secondary flows for a very obvious reason, that they drive new primary flows. So although if you think short-sightedly, some people leaving from countries of first reception in an illegal way, despite the provisions of the Dublin regulation, which is currently still in force, this would drive a new wave of primary uh, arrival. So our policy is to protect our, both, uh, our borders both ways, 
both our external borders and the internal borders to the European Union and prevent secondary flows. And that why we also participate in the Vienna Declaration, as you know. We're working together with the organizations entrusted to the protection of the Western Balkan route. And we do hope that, and we will work in the direction of reducing this kind of secondary flows. Having said that, we anticipate Europe to make progress. Progress on the Pact on Migration and Asylum that in our view has to achieve two objectives. Objective number one and very critical is to mitigate irregular arrivals. And I think we need to do more work in the pact to that direction. The second point, which is critical obviously for the countries of first reception, is the issue of solidarity. Although this is very clearly linked to the first, because in environments of very low primary flows, the need for solidarity it's reduced or even diminished. The problem is what would happen if you have crisis again in the future. And this is what drives the concern of countries of first reception when we're discussing for the new pact. Thank you so much, Mr. Minister, for this perfect introduction to the issue and the overview. I would like to turn to you, Mr. Minister. I think uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina has uh, done a lot of efforts in implementing a new system, a new asylum law, uh, just starting also uh, with the whole procedures with refugees. So uh, after a while, you are now a minister uh, for security in this country. What is your assessment about this? What went well? What is the situation at the moment? Maybe you can give us a short overview about Bosnia-Herzegovina today. Well, gladly, Mr. Director General. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Being a student of history, security, international relations, I like putting things in some kind of context. Um, why is the interest of the migrants for European states so high, despite the fact that we don't live the era of Eurocentric world any longer? Um, and Europe generally is uh, having globally uh, smaller and smaller participation in many domains of power. Just to illustrate that, at the end of World War II, uh, the overall world uh, GDP was made more than a half by European states. And European states participated in overall world population with more than 25%. Today, that GDP contribution of Europe is somewhere around 20%, and population contribution is below 10%, and the trends are even more discouraging. Uh, but, you know, those countries of Central Asia, Middle East, North Africa, uh, have got a huge number of people, and we are not dealing with the causes of all these migrations, but it's obviously that the trend of their interest is still present and will continue to deal with this challenge. And it's impossible to put the migrations, irregular, illegal, uh, out of context of many other security threats, risks and challenges, because it is our experience that migrants participate in almost all kinds of security breaches, violations, uh, or some kind of disorder in, in our state. And we experienced the different stages of the attitude of both people and institutions, from Kant's principle of general hospitality at the beginning to the level of complete exclusion and ignorance at some stages. Now, we have come to a state of regulated and manageable operations with illegal migrations. Just to illustrate that, currently within our camps, uh, we have got some 2.5 thousand people. Uh, and we believe that at least one more thousand or thousand and a half uh, in some uh, illegal, uh, private accommodation, wandering through different routes and, and woods uh, through Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, but that whole number is almost three times smaller 
than the number of irregular migrants you used to have a year ago. And that trend is very positive. We have tightened the control of our eastern border. Even though we have got a kind of ridiculous situation, the migrants are coming from European Union to Bosnia. Go to Europe. Through, through uh, Macedonia, Serbia. And are again ending up in European Union, even though the policy and practice of Croatia has made the Croatian borders towards Bosnia uh, much better tight and sealed than was the case with our border previously. Now we are trying to better control our uh, eastern border. We also made a lot of efforts to improve the coordination of all security um, structures within the country. Uh, we apprehended some of those criminal groups um, smuggling with, with the migrants. We improved the management of the camps. We improved the cooperation of different levels of our state organization structures. Um, cooperation with international community and I need to repeat that EU support and especially EU delegation in Sarajevo support to our structures has been very instrumental and I would say decisive in logistic sense for our capacity to manage uh, migration management and, and all our operations associated with them. We still do not have the appropriate level of political cooperation and, and somehow, somehow balanced political attitude. Um, we have got almost half of the country ignoring the fact that we have got migrations and illegal migrations in particular. Also, half of other half is ignoring any kind of practical involvement. But we still have professionals at our state level institutions at, at all kinds that are capable, willing uh, to be effective uh, and responsible. So uh, we manage to significantly improve the quality of our migration operations uh, to reduce the number of, of people uh, illegally present there to Im improve the quality of our asylum system. Um, we have passed some of those relevant, important, comprehensive plans on measures and activities associated with migration management, new strategies for migrations and the whole set of documents. So we have covered a long path in the last year, but it's still a long way to go ahead of us. Uh, and we believe that we live an era of mutual interdependence, no country regardless of its size and strength in the world, could provide its own security alone. And it's uh, applicable to migrations as well. And we need to realize that level. And I very much like the title of your conference. I guess the mutual cooperation and partnerships here are crucially important. We uh, organize some of those initiatives and for the first time next month, we'll organize a regional conference uh, on migrations because we now see the, the capacity not just to organize events, but to offer some of the valuable experiences to our partners. And we look forward for having better cooperation with all our immediate and wider neighbors because this is a common challenge and we need to fight it together. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister, for this introduction and putting this in a broader concept. Uh, I would like to welcome Peter Siarto, the Minister of Foreign Affairs and Trade of Hungary. Welcome. Thank you. And, uh, of course, we would also like to hear from your side, uh, Mr. Minister, what is your assessment at the moment? We have seen this increase along the Western Balkan routes. Uh, I know Hungary was always very supportive to all the Western Balkan countries, especially with their perspective to European Union. And um, the question is how to help and, and how to support, because uh, this will be a phenomenon that is ongoing. So maybe you could start with that. Well, thank you so much. And uh, first of all, Your Excellency, I have to express my apologies for all three of you and for the audience 
please do not take uh, it as a uh, sign of disrespect that uh, I was late. Uh, we had some conflicts in managing our own schedule, so I hope uh, I can make it up with my performance here. Um, I will do my best for sure. What we experience currently, unfortunately, I can tell you, is a uh, very quickly growing uh, number of, um, of those who attempt to uh, break through our southern border. Uh, there are dozens of attempts uh, on a daily basis now to violate our border either from Serbia or from Croatia. You know that this is the classical Western Balkan route on which we have experienced uh, very heavy pressure back in 2015. And now we experience an ever-growing pressure as well. This year, more than 82,000 persons tried to violate our border in the south, which is external border of European Union partly, and the Schengen area uh, also. Since 2015, we have spent 1.2 billion euros on protecting the border, which includes the construction costs of the fence itself and the cost of the human resources. Our police uh, has been there 24-7. Our army used to be there also. We received some help from the other Visegrad countries. Now a, um, a group of uh, Czech uh, policemen uh, is going to arrive to help us out. Because in the meantime, we are helping uh, on the southern border of both Serbia and North Macedonia. And we have a small contingent in the framework of Frontex to help our Greek friends to protect their own uh, border. But uh, besides the um, growing number of, um, of the, those who attempt, who, those who make attempts to uh, violate our border, we see a change regarding the approach in the European Union. I remember six years ago in 2015, when we started to uh, build the fence, we were confronted with very heavy criticism, very hostile approach. We were even compared by some colleagues of ours with the worst and darkest dictatorships of the 20th century. I might recall the comments made by that time Austrian Chancellor or that time Prime Minister of Croatia or other European friends. Uh, those comments are totally uncomparable to the comments that they are making now. So currently, I understand that in Europe, everybody applauds those who protect their external borders and who build a fence on the external border. We applauded Greece um, at the, was it the beginning of last year, when you struggled a lot uh, with Turkey when the migrants were putting enormous pressure on your border. We applauded you to, um, to protect the border. We applaud the Polish brothers of ours and the Baltic friends to build fence on their border. Unfortunately, there are only three of us in the Foreign Affairs Council who used to be there in 2015 and who are now there, obviously. And I know that politics is not a profession of credits, so obviously no one will ask for apologies for saying different things in, back in 2015 and saying different things now in 2021. But if this is the price, it's okay <laughs> if, if now the common European position is that we have to protect the external border. But our concern in the meantime is that parallelly to this kind of changing of the approach, a similar kind of irresponsible statements are being made by institutions in Brussels and some Western European politicians, which can be translated as invitation in the mindset of those who are ready to move for some reason. And I think now we are in a bigger danger than we were back in 2015. And why? Because now basically we are kind of circumvented by migratory pressure. Because we have the ordinary or regular pressure from the south, namely from Africa, from the sub-Saharan region. By the way, it's really, it's really crazy that the current Libyan government is being accused by NGOs for, being, for not respecting human rights because they started to protect their southern border, so it's really 
silly to say, unfortunately, sorry to use this expression. So we have this southern direction. Now as a totally new phenomenon, we have the pressure from the east, which was never the case before. And we have the danger and risk of the southeast uh, direction through the Western Balkans route if the migratory flaws um, blow out from Afghanistan. Because what happens there? There's a population of 39 million people, out of which 4 million have already been um, IDPs, internally displaced persons. So they are on the move already, and I'm pretty sure that they left their homes not in order to see Kabul, but to leave the country. To be honest, we cannot count on Iran to stop them. So they arrived to Turkey, with which European Union still doesn't have a common understanding on whether we paid 6 billion euros or less on what uh, and, and how, right? And then you have the Western Balkans, and then you have the southern border of Hungary. So we, we really think that if any time, then now we definitely have to be cautious with statements. We have to put the, um, the um, methodology of uh, obligatory quotas into the drawer finally and, and lock it. And not to make statements which uh, would uh, encourage people to, to get on the move. This is, this is how we see the, the situation currently. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister. As always, you are very outspoken. And uh, this is for the moderator the best because then discussion is starting. So, of course, Mr. Minister, you wanted to reply to the statement of Mr. Siarto. I just wanted to confirm his uh, understanding that there is a change in the way the European Union is looking at the issue of border protection. A few months ago, there was a joint letter sent between, uh, on the initiative of Greece and the Netherlands signed by a number of EU member states asking the Commission to think again around the concept of border protection given the situation in Belarus, which I think it was one of the cases that sort of the Council was united in condemning the behavior of Belarus, that it was using people that are not from Belarus uh, for political purposes, and that was sort of a rare unanimity in both the Foreign Affairs Council and the Internal Affairs Council. And then you had the letter sent by the majority of member states now and was discussed at the recent council meeting in Luxembourg, asking for the European Union, for example, to stop a policy that has ar arised in 2011, not to finance the construction of fencing. But having said that, and given the fact today is not a political forum also, but it sort of focuses on deeper thinking, we need to ensure that a stronger border protection of the European Union, it's only part of a strategy. A strategy needs also to include our friends and neighbors. Because we cannot make sure, we cannot have this stronger protection policy, which Greece, as you know, strongly supports, used against the neighborhood. So we need to make sure that countries in the neighborhood do not have undue pressure from the fact that the European Union now it has a stronger stance against illegal migration. That's the one thing we need to work. And that's why we think, and that it was resolved at the Med 5 meeting in Malaga, that the external dimension needs to become a priority for the European Commission. And the external dimension does not require the new pact. It will obviously be helped by the new pact. And clearly Greece supports a fast resolution of the new pact. But there are things we can do today, and working on the external dimension is something we can do today. And also we need to find ways to work at the countries of origin providing support and legal pathways. And that should be done in exchange of smashing smuggling network. We're not against migrants, we're against smugglers. And I think that's a clear policy position from us. Can I join uh, the minister in two, and yes. I don't want to interrupt, sorry. Uh, Please. Just, just two, um, in two points. First, that uh, I agree that a uh, successful European policy on migration cannot take place in case we are not able to cooperate with our neighborhood. So that's why, uh, let's, see the, um, let's see Egypt, for example, a country which has been protecting its maritime borders since 2016 in a way that no illegal migrants could leave Egypt, regardless of the fact that there are six to seven million migrants living on the territory of Egypt, must be respected. What we are doing, we are holding back 120 million euros from them uh, in the framework of European neighborhood policy because of human rights issues. 
we are not convening the, um, the, the uh, association council with them, and, and we still keep regulations in force which keep them away of buying technologies through which they could protect their own border better, which, which would ensure uh, our security. On the other hand, uh, when it comes to migration policy and legal pathways and labor migration, I think that should be kept purely as a uh, national competence. Let's leave the member states, let's let the member states decide mm -hmm. whether they want to allow people to go to their countries for any reason, and respect the rights of those countries who say that, no, thank you, we don't want to take uh, part in that. Because I think the most important principle or approach should be that we bring help where it is needed, but do not import problems where there are no problems yet. Thank you. Uh, may I start uh, with you, Mr. Minister, concerning the role of Bosnia-Herzegovina in the framework of uh, these migration partnerships? You have just negotiated, I think, with Pakistan a readmission agreement, and of course uh, you would like uh, to continue with other countries. So partnership is crucial for everybody. Uh, this is, uh, I think, the main story about this. But maybe you could also tell us a little bit, uh, it's not so easy for Bosnia-Herzegovina not being uh, presented in all these countries of origin how we could help more also from the European Union that uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina is establishing a partnership like this? Well, I believe that uh, there exists a strong reluctance of those countries of origin to negotiate readmission agreements with any of the countries uh, belonging to either the transition or the final destination category of countries. There were some specific reasons of the days we managed to convince the government of Pakistan to uh, negotiate and accept that readmission agreement we signed uh, at the beginning of November last year. We have been using this pattern uh, in negotiations with Bangladesh, with Afghanistan, some Northern African states, Middle East states. Uh, we do make some progress on those individual parts, but uh, no tangible effects or uh, readiness for agreement signature on the horizon anywhere. Uh, and I guess if you go again into the wider context, all these migrants, have got their own expectations and convictions. Uh, visiting the Lipa camp, the famous camp we established after the incidents we had at the New Year's Eve last year, together with Ambassador Zatla, uh, we talked to a Pakistani migrant who told us that he was returned seven times from Milano, from north of Italy, and we asked him, then what are you waiting for? I mean, what, what do you expect? He said, I'm going to make it. I've got two brothers in Germany, and I'm going to join them. Sooner or later, I will make it, and I will make game, the games or attempts as many times as it takes until I, I make it. Um, and there was a kind of extension of conversation. Do you really believe in it? And we know that Germany needs us. We are the, the necessary labor force. Uh, my brothers have already got their qualifications. They started their, their, their business there, and I will, I will do the same. So uh, regardless of what we publicly say, there is a kind of unspoken um, way of thinking and communica communication among the migrants. And I do trust all these measures, uh, but I, for, for obvious reasons reflected to the need to deal with origins and, and causes of all these migration moves, especially if you take into consideration the, the fact that thousands and thousands of them ended up in water, waters of Mediterranean or the valleys and hills of the Balkans. So it's not a joyride for any one of them. It's a very dangerous uh, decision to make very risky, 
Uh, but if you keep that in mind, it's very important that we cooperate mutually, not just in terms of control of our national borders, our national security, regional security, but we cannot ignore the fact that among those, uh, majority of which being those just thinking for better, better future and, and better way of living, uh, there are some that have got very dangerous intentions or the background. Uh, and it's, it's very important to recognize, isolate those who are dangerous and treat them in a kind of separate security fashion. And I guess additional level of cooperation is needed because uh, with all these trends, I don't think that migration, uh, migrations are the topic of this year or the, or the next year. I mean, migrations are imminent part of, of the mankind way of living. Uh, migrations do have their ups and downs, their increase and decrease stages, but will continue to be uh, our realm in years to come. And we need to tackle them uh, upon ourselves in very serious contexts. For the time being, it has got some kind of political security, humanitarian, and to some extent economic, economic dimension. But I guess it's very obvious, uh, sooner uh, rather than later, it's gonna become uh, cultural, civilizational, demographic uh, issue that we need to consider in the context of all changes that are being made by the increased presence of those migrants. Most of them are smoothly uh, integrating themselves into the societies of, of the states, but what's gonna happen in a few decades time when we have got next generations of those uh, migrants being uh, overwhelmingly participating in the uh, breakdown of the, of the population and what are going to be the, the consequences. Uh, but for the time being, I mean, this is a kind of longer term perspective, but today we need to, to focus on some uh, current operations, keeping in mind the background, potential danger of those who are coming. That's why we try now to organize higher level of cooperation of the whole region. Most of our neighbors are very receptive and, and proactive, whatever we proposed and, and we need, we have got the, the idea of increasing the cooperation for the goods of all the states. We are not doing this just for the sake of Bosnia and Herzegovina. We are doing this for the sake of, uh, of the Western Balkans and Europe as a whole. I mean, our part of the world has got historic, geographical, cultural, civilizational meaning, linking Occident and Orient, meaning Europe and, and, and Asia. And we believe in terms of migrations, we do have a role to play. And this fact that our migrants, saying ours, because we, we consider them being our care, our need to deal with them. They are coming from European Union and they are headed towards European Union. But we need to deal with, to, to deal with them uh, anyway. And, and we, want, we are trying to have more and more comprehensive approach from our own position, better and better integrated approach with our neighbors, and we believe that there still exists room and need for improvements in cooperation with EU delegation uh, and EU in, in general. And that's, what, uh, that's uh, why we are so enthusiastic about the meaning of the conference and the exchange we make here. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister sharing with us your experience. May I turn to you, Minister Mitaraki. Uh, I found a quote from your side from August. The only sure thing is that in the face of a possible wave of migration, Greece will not be limited to the role of observer, but will play an active role in the European fora to deal with it effectively. End of the quote. So my question is, does this mean you will also use maybe these migration partnerships 
as being also named in the Pact on Migration and Asylum as one of the instruments for the future to play an active role and to look forward how you can negotiate and come to a solution with the partners. I think Greece has been vocal from the very beginning that migration is a crisis that affects everyone. Not only the European Union, not only our neighbors, not only the Western world, but the whole planet. So it is something that requires deep cooperation, it requires fostering relationships, requires a lot of activities in countries of origin, in countries of transit. And it's not simply, I heard a quote earlier today, that external dim uh, dimension years ago, it was simply meant readmission agreements. It's obviously something much deeper. But as I alluded before, it's not the pact that alone will make progress for the European Union. There are three areas where we think we can have progress before that. And in these fields, Greece is trying to have a more active role in the context of the Council of the European Union. One I mentioned already is the, the point of the external dimension. The second point is border protection. We can do more, and I think the fact that now the majority of member states are talking about enhancing the security at the external border as something that needs to be done by the European Union, I think that's a very good recognition of the struggle that the continent is facing. The third point I think we need to do is we need to work not in a bilateral level, as our friends from Bosnia and Herzegovina is trying try to do with regard to returns. No member state can have the same influence in the external dimension and ensuring returns of those not entitled according to our legal system to international protection. I think this is something that needs to become a European competence. Mm -hmm. I think the European Union needs to be the key driver of such agreements. We, there is international law, there is national law, there is European acquis that says very clearly who is entitled to protection in Europe. And obviously this is a duty we have to discharge properly. This is the values of the European Union, this is the values of Europe. But the whole concept of the asylum system, and last year with the help of EASO, we were able to issue 105,000 asylum decisions in Greece, just to give you the scale of the challenge Greece went through. But the whole concept of asylum works when you can actually discern between those entitled to protection and, not, and those not entitled to protection. Because if somebody comes for seven times and in the end stays in Europe, then the whole concept of international law, the whole concept of asylum law, the whole process of interviewing people and making individual decisions, doesn't make sense. So I think it is very critical for the credibility of the European asylum legislation, for the credibility of our global humanitarian values to be able to distinguish and be able to return those not entitled to protection. So these are three areas where Greece is trying, working with our partners in the European Union to make progress, the external dimension, the protection of the borders, and a common European return mechanism. If we achieve a common European return mechanism, and actually we're able to return those not entitled to protection with safety and dignity, I think the public opinion in Europe will feel again warmer as it should be in the concept of providing refugees. And I have to tell you, at a country like Greece that we have faced a lot of pressure in the last few years through migration, our public opinion, both from the left and the right, welcome very much the fact that 700 people from Afghanistan came to Greece and we gave protection to people entitled to. That got a lot of positive attention from people that at the same time feel not supportive of illegal flows and smuggling networks. So I think it's critical for migration to be able to make this distinction. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister. I turn to you, Peter, uh, concerning uh, external dimension and looking forward for migration partnerships. I remember quite well Hungary and the Visegrad countries have been very much active in the north of Africa. You wanted, of course, to support countries to set up their uh, border management systems and so on. So what is your assessment about the pact in this regard of the external dimension? Well, I'll tell you a story which uh, might uh, sound uh, unbelievable, but unfortunately it's true, and shows the, um, the speed, or rather lack of a speed, when um, we have to act in order to um, um, avoid migratory flaws um, from North Africa. So I think we all do agree 
that our um, security regarding the South starts at North Africa. If the countries of the North African belt are stable enough, are strong enough to protect their own borders, then the migratory flow from that direction would definitely diminish. So when it comes to um, uh, Libya, we have uh, made a pledge, the four Visegrad countries, and the date is important, December 2017. December 2017. We all allocated 8.75 8 um, 8 um, million euros, meaning 35 million euros together from our taxpayers' money, to the Libyan Coast Guard to be able to buy boats and ships in order to be able to patrol their own um, northern or maritime border in order not to allow the migratory flaw to come basically uh, without any kind of obstacle to the southern part of Europe. December 2017. Today, it's uh, October 2021. We have given the money to the Africa Trust Fund of the European Union. Okay, how many ships and boats have been bought so far from this money of the taxpayers? What, what's, your, what's your guess? Zero. Zero. So, December 2017, we allocated the money of our own taxpayers to the European Union to buy ships and boats uh, for the Libyan Coast Guard. And now, the Commission starts to tell us that it's a big success story because now they started to buy uh, the ships. Four years, almost four years have gone. So, uh, to be honest, sometimes I don't understand that whether uh, the bureaucrats in Brussels do have the intention to stop the migration or to further encourage the migration. Because if you only look at their statements and their actions, then it's obvious that they don't want us uh, to be able to stop uh, the migratory flows. That's the same with Egypt. I told you about the, the restrictive uh, measures there. So what I do hope is that the Libyan government, the current one, is not going to be under pressure as they start to protect their southern border. Because I think the approach should be, should be very clear here. Border protection is not a human rights issue. Border protection is a security issue. And uh, when um, illegal migrants come from Serbia to Hungary, for example, or from Croatia to Hungary, to be honest, we do not understand why anybody of these should be considered as a refugee. Because in Serbia, neither in Serbia nor in Croatia, there's no war. Nobody's life is in danger. So my question is, why we should allow anybody to come to Hungary from a territory of a safe country by violating our border? Because here international law, international law should be used as a starting point. What does international law say? International, and here I think this is a solution for the problems of our, West, of our Western Balkans friends when you say, you say the same as the Serbs say, that look, what, what do, you, do you as Europeans expect us, Bosniaks and Serbs to do when the migrants are coming from an EU member state and would like to continue their way to another EU member state? So what, are, what do we expect here? So the international law says that if someone is forced to leave his or her home because of any reasons, then he or she is allowed to stay on the territory of the first safe country on a temporary basis, as long as the reasons of him or her fleeing from his or her home are existing. And it doesn't say that you have the right to you know, cross series of safe countries. It doesn't say that you have the right to go to Germany. It doesn't say that you have the right to go to Sweden. So my, what I do not understand when it comes to international approach, to be honest, that we, we are always accused for um, you know, um, not complying with rule of law, not complying with international regulations, and here there's a very clear international law. And then, and then we put pressure on countries which protect their borders towards safe countries, and we tell people, okay, you are allowed to, you are allowed to cross uh, borders between safe countries, but why? 
So I think, I think here this approach should be put uh, in a clear position finally. The Europeans should understand that border protection is a must. Border protection is a matter of statehood. If you as a state cannot protect your border, uh, then you lose a very important aspect of your, of your sovereignty. And we should not, should not put pressure on others, including the North Africans, uh, not to protect uh, their own borders to the extent they can do so. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister. I think this is a lot to discuss, so I would like to open up uh, to the audience and uh, to our uh, visitors over the web. And uh, for that, Cecilia will take the floor to collect the questions, and then we will ask the panelists to answer. Please, Cecilia. Thank you very much. Yeah, I see all of the hands in the air. Just shortly before you take the floor, it would be good if you could state your full name and uh, country organization as well, and also to try to be short. And please also uh, direct the question to, if it's to the whole panel or to one of the panelists. So um, I have two questions already, so please, gentlemen, there, if you can, please. The microphone is coming. I will take a couple of questions and then hand them over to the panel. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Ahmed Salehin. I am from Bangladesh. I work in the Ministry of Expatriate Welfare and Overseas Employment as its secretary. Uh, and thank you very much for a very impressive and essential discussion. Just a question. Uh, before I make a question to our Honorable Minister of Hungary, uh, I, I have a comment that, uh, okay, when we talk about migration, we always try to mix it up with illegal migration. I think migration and illegal migration has become a kind of synonymous thing. But as we know that migration can be used as a tool for development, and it is being used as a tool for development for many countries. So just by accepting legal migration is not good enough. I think that we need to promote legal migration. You need to promote legal migration because what we understand or the migration literature says that when you encourage legal migration, promote legal migration, you can do away with a lot of illegal migration, which is happening in the case of European Union. I am not trying to limit myself to a particular region or country, not to talk about Hungary, or what is happening in Croatia or Portugal. So my question to Honorable Minister is, not as a particular country, as a member of the European community, don't you think that we need to encourage migration for development or migration as a tool for development? And I think, just I would like to know from you, your point of view. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, I will take one more question here from the lady. Uh, a bit further inside, I can see if a mic is coming your way. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for, so much for having us here. Thank you, ICMPD, for putting such a good event together. Uh, my name is Lisa. I'm from the Republic of Kosovo, Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs and Diaspora. I think when I look through all the sessions and when I understand the burden of migration as it's been spilled throughout the session, it gives me a feeling that we are not understanding the urgency of the shift that is happening. If we were to quote the latest report of the future workforce after COVID-19 of McKinsey Institute, it talks about 100 million people shifting their position into eight, eight world economies in a matter of 10 years. And when we look at the opportunities of migration between realizing the potential there is a shift on talk. We look at it, that, that negative connotation of migration rather than looking at the opportunities. And I think we got to diasporize a bit the migration topic and bringing the stories within what is positive. I get the security issue, uh, well aware of it. I understand uh, the political pressure internally, but I also think we have to realize that the change is happening faster than ever before, and it would never be slower. So the question now that remains is, what are the three top realizations? And I don't have a question to particular ministers, but from all points of view, it's always looking into the negatives of it. How about we shift the mindset and look into positives of it? Because the world is changing 
and we ought to apply. What has guaranteed in the past success in terms of strategies is not going to guarantee success in the future. So what is the future that you're pushing? Because uh, the, the change and shift is happening in your own communities without realizing. And to just give a, a response to the Minister of Hungary when he says, I do not understand why people from a stable countries do ch choose to, to, to move. I think it's, the answer to me is very clear. Migration is right. You choose where you want to be. But we have to figure out a way on, on sharing that burden, so to say. But the burden is more opportunity versus the weakness. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, take one more question here uh, on the side. Do we have a microphone here? And then I will uh, hand it over to, to the panel after these three. Good afternoon, everybody. I am Haytham Shujaaddin, Ambassador of Yemen to Austria. Uh, as you know, in many countries which is suffering uh, war or conflict, Yemen. there is many uh, displaced people, people who escape from the conflict zone to save, you know, uh, cities internally. Uh, my question for the all ministers, what's the rule that the European Union could do to support these displaced people in their homeland? to let them stay and create new future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, hand over to the panel and yes. uh, start with, please, with question for. Who would like to start? Please, Mr. Mitz Minister Mitrakis. Mm -hmm. I think there are two topics raised by the question. One is migration as a right. Mig people have the right to apply for migration. Countries do not have the obligation to provide residence permits to people. This is a sovereign choice. You then have the Geneva Convention. The through Article 31 talks about people that are eligible for international protection. And there, I have to say, Peter is right. The Geneva Convention talks about direct movements. So from a country of risk to a country of non-risk. And when we were in Malta last week for the 10-year celebration of EASO, the Deputy High Commissioner for International Protection of the United Nations, High Commission for Refugees, spoke against asylum shopping. Very rightly so. Providing support to people when you have a problem, you knock the door of your neighbor. That's what we do in our daily life if we have a problem at home. We ring the bell next door and ask for help. <coughs> That's what people should do. In the 90s, Greece received over 10% of our population, over 10% of our population from a neighboring country. And we accepted it. And these people now live in Greece and they have fully integrated and are part of our society. And we are very open in providing support to people needed as part of international arrangement. Although I have to say Greece is privileged not to be neighboring countries at war. We're neighboring democracies. We're neighboring well-functioning countries to, to all the directions of Greece. And therefore, that raises a big question about the eligibility of people to apply for international protection in Greece. Having said that, obviously, and I did make the remark before, as the European Union, we need to ensure that there is no undue pressure to our neighbors. Now, on the point of legal migration, I couldn't agree more. We need people. This is obvious. And Greece, for example, is running now a number of schemes to attract people. We started this year a program for digital nomads. We started a program focusing on neighboring countries, giving five years working visa for seasonal workers. We have a lot of schemes that people can apply for residency in Greece. It is a sovereign right, it's a national issue. I agree with that. And we are trying to attract people. And we're also trying to attract people on a humanitarian basis, participating in relocation programs. But that needs to be our choice. I think what has created a negative stance towards migration to our public opinions is A, because it's driven by smugglers. It's driven by people making hundreds of millions of euros from people suffering. This is one thing that caused a very negative perception of migration to, to the people in our countries. And the second is the fact that we haven't persuaded our, our public opinion that we're keeping only those, those entitled to protection and not everybody. Because the failure of return system has jeopardized the very well uh, written concept of international protection. So I think it's critical for the credibility of the asylum system that we're able to return 
the cases where people are not eligible for protection and shouldn't they come seven times because that demonstrates clearly that they, they know how to abuse our systems. Thank you very much, Minister Cikotic, if you like to reply. Uh, well, brief comments on all three questions. Um, I guess I, the colleague from Bangladesh has got a concern with the term illegal. Um, I don't think we have got more appropriate term when you have got huge number of people coming without any kind of ID and when you try to identify them in one registration center during a single day you register seven Muhammad Ali's from Egypt born on January the 1st 2000 period. Yeah. So, and, and we have no trust that we are getting the, the proper legal identities and that we are dealing with people in legal, legal fashion. So the clarification of the term, I guess, is less important than the essence of operations we run. We try to be very hospitable towards them, but once the migrants started robbing our homes, uh, torturing our girls and kids, and killing some people, change the attitude of the population and the institutions. And you need to, to take that in, into consideration when you... In, and you are between obeying the human rights of those migrants and law and order, safety and security of your own people and your own families. So you need to provide, you have got the strong media pressure, society pressure, to call this the proper name. They are there illegally. So I don't think it's, it's an issue, but I, I do understand that most of them know that somehow they are invited for the countries they are headed towards, and they do see themselves, the major body of them, as tools for development for their own sake and for the sake of countries they are headed to. So I, I guess that's, that's the essence. Uh, on the comment and question of speed of change, I guess the overall speed of change is constantly growing and it's not growing linearly. It's an exponential growth. And this is why I put this whole topic into much wider issue because uh, we need to, to have a look at the horizon, if you want, just of demo demographic changes that are taking place in Europe. And if we are not well prepared today, in two decades, it's going to be too late. I don't think we are going to be in full control of operations. That's why I, I believe that your question is so uh, well positioned and, and I guess should be taken as, as an alarm for many different different respects. I've heard an uh, informal story that a construction company in Bosnia started employing some migrants this year, uh, which is very alarming. We were screaming for the high level of unemployment until a year or two ago. Now we don't have domestic workforce for our own construction purposes. And I guess this even hit even harder some Western and Northern European states. So just thank you for the, uh, for the question. Uh, and on the question of the term you use, people escape from their countries, I guess most of them do not escape but leave or flee from their homelands. I, I may accept that maybe your country and some other, but most of them are not under any kind of um, immediate danger or, or obvious threat that they have got to live. But it's just the living conditions uh, within the states of origin and a kind of more and more visible demographic implosion in Europe with high level of economic strength and wealth that attracts those people to, to move. Apart from some uh, unspoken or, or rumors that somehow they are invited to, to come to some European states and that they are even uh, in, in a way um, regulated and coordinated in terms of migration, migration routes. Uh, I wouldn't speculate with that, with that um, 
allegation, but I would uh, simply say we need to have better coordination within Europe and with some states along the routes of the movement of these people uh, and make this safer because I don't think these are young people uh, work and reproductive future of their own or some other countries and I don't think if we continue losing them in so high numbers um, it's, it's going to be a huge expense that we are not allowed to, to make to ourselves. So, um, simply uh, don't think that they are escaping, but by circumstances, uh, they are forced to leave most of the countries uh, and look for better and safer future. Thank you very much. Minister Siato, please. Thank you very much. Uh, regarding uh, the Honorable State Secretary um, uh, from uh, Bangladesh, why we usually speak about illegal migration when we speak about migration is because um, the, um, the European Union would like to have a common approach on how to fight that phenomenon. We don't have to deal with so-called legal migration on a community level because it's a national competence. And when you pose the question whether it could be looked at the phenomenon of migration as an opportunity? I would say some countries might answer your question with yes. Some countries, including mine, would answer your question with no. But, but that's not a problem, because this is a national competence. We do not need migration from our own perspective. We do not need to operate uh, n no kind of uh, channels of migration from the perspective of Hungary. But I respect that other countries, even in Europe, might think that they need migration in order to develop or in order to um, fill up their um, uh, labor pool or whatever. It's not my job to, to discuss. But I think mutual respect is extremely important here. So as I respect other countries thinking about migration as a necessary phenomenon from the perspective of their own development, I expect them to respect us thinking the other way around, who do not think that migration would be necessary or important from our perspective, because it's not. So um, uh, I, I think respecting the national competencies here is extremely important. When it comes to um, my dear colleague, the uh, Deputy um, uh, Minister of Interior of, of Kosovo, um, now we it might sound that I don't agree with you, but I, I, I definitely think that there's no uh, disagreement between us. Maybe I was not clear enough. When I say that no one has the right to violate a border between two safe countries, I, I don't mean those, for example, from Kosovo, who have a passport, would like to go to Europe, would like to ask for a permission to work in Germany or whatever. This is a legal way of, of migration, if you want that. But those who came from, we don't know where, now, nowadays on the southern border of Hungary, everybody considers him or herself Afghan. Okay? Six years ago, everybody considered him or herself Syrian. And we had the similar phenomenon, like the Bosniak friends, everybody was born on the very same day with the very same name. Uh, so, but those people have no right to cross the border between Serbia and Hungary, because they don't have the travel documentations for that, and they are not passing a border between a non-safe and safe country. So, violating the border between two safe countries with reference to asylum is no go. It's totally against international law. Uh, I hope we understand each other and I hope that you, we, we, we don't uh, differ uh, on that. And when it comes to, um, so migration as such, I mean, picking a country where I would like to live and in order to get there, go through a series of safe countries is not a human right. It's, not, it's totally not a human right. Last question from our dear guest from, from Yemen. Our principal position is that we have to bring help where it is needed in order to change circumstances in a way which enable those who have been living there to stay there. Because I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure that it's much better to enjoy circumstances where you live than being forced to leave, right? I might think, I, I, I might be not totally mistaken. So that's why, for example, we have a program called Hungary Helps. In, this, in the framework of this program, we have already spent $70 million 
of helping 250,000 Christians to be able to stay in their homelands in the Middle East because they were forced to leave. We have, uh, you know, their hospitals, their schools, they were un dysfunctional, their houses were torn down. What we have done, we went there, we reconstructed their houses, we reconstructed their schools, we covered the financial costs, uh, the financial, uh, um, we, we covered the, the, um, uh, the financial aspects of their operation of the hospitals, their institutions, whatever, so they could stay. So with $70 million, we helped 250,000 Christians to stay in the Middle East, in their homelands, instead of encouraging them to leave, with which we would have contributed to the goals of those who wanted them to leave. So um, thinking the other way around, this, this is our way of thinking. Thank you very much. So we have questions from the online audience. You can't see it in the room. So I will uh, just read it out and then I would like to ask the ministers also to answer these questions, uh, maybe two, three minutes, something like that, so that we can keep the time. First question was, what are the lessons learned from past cooperation between the European Union and the Western Balkans? What has been working well and what is missing? The second question is, how can the countries of the Western Balkans enhance their interregional cooperation? Third one, it's about the current policies. F there is too much focus on protecting the borders. Shouldn't other policies, especially integration, be more emphasized? And the last one is, don't you think the current rhetoric and calls for building fences are causing Europe to lose the leverage with countries in other parts of the world hosting refugees? So maybe we could uh, start again. Maybe you will start first, Peter. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, regarding EU and the Western Balkans, I uh, really do believe that we need to enlarge the European Union. If you are not able to bring forward the enlargement agenda, uh, then we will lose credibility in the Western Balkans. There's no vacuum in global politics. There will be others to integrate if we do not integrate. Whenever Western Balkans is on the agenda of the Foreign Affairs Council, usually what happens is that many colleagues are complaining and crying about the fact that there are other actors, third countries, Qatar, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Russia, China, whoever, uh, who would like to have a role in the Western Balkans. But my question is that then why don't we make steps? You cannot win a game if you don't go on the pitch. Uh, and uh, we have the best chance as European Union to integrate this region. But for some reason, on the communication level, everybody is very supportive. When we close the doors, only the complaints and the preconditions are being listed. So I think the biggest mistake European Union can commit is not to integrate the Western Balkans. It's a, it's an, it's a very unnatural situation that you have European Union, non-European Union, European Union again. So uh, Serbia, would definitely be a key country uh, in this regard. With Montenegro, we have opened all the chapters, uh, but the whole thing has been slowed down. And regard of the fact that pure North poor North Macedonians have given up many things, you know, the other day they are not allowed to start negotiations. I, you know, I mean, we are not in the same party group with the prime minister there, so I could even not care. But but it's it's not a party issue. My question is what that poor prime minister can tell his own. Citizens, you know, we have given up everything. We were promised to start negotiations, but, but it's not given. So I think losing credibility is, is a real, uh, is a real um, uh, danger here. And I, I do hope that, that once the enlargement procedure uh, will, will go um, forward. And the other two questions, um, you know, regarding um, uh, the border control, I think, every, I think things need a sequence. And the number one in the sequence is, that we get back our ability to protect ourselves and to get back the ability of ours to make a decision on our own, whom we allow to come to Europe and whom we do not allow, and to make our decision on our own with whom we are ready to live together and with whom not. And let's leave it to the uh, member states, let's leave it to the countries, let's leave it to the national competence to be uh, decided um, upon that. And, and I, I really do think that, that once we get back this kind of ability or capacity uh, of ours, we will be much more relaxed when we speak about migration. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister. Minister Tsitkotic, please. Well, the 
questions we have got uh, in front of us could be a good uh, ground for another panel. And I would try to summarize them and say that we are witnessing some changes that would result with Europeanization of the Balkans and hopefully not with Balkanization of Europe. Uh, and I, I guess more and more me, we need interests of Europe being uh, projected and uh, placed in a sincere and functional fa fashion. Uh, we do have different experiences from, from these different historic periods, including the recent history. And we are very much grateful to European Commission delegation of EU in, in, in Sarajevo, and we constantly repeat to the functioning mechanism of that cooperation. Uh, but we do see the lack of consistency in some EU documents or the gaps between different European states, and that very much reflects to the realm on the ground of the Western Balkans and the way the, the operations are conducted there. Um, what we see now is a very pragmatic sense of common interest, and we are proposing higher level of cooperation between uh, countries of the region we belong to on pure interest basis. And we are hopeful uh, and optimistic that that approach could somewhat elevate and improve the level of our cooperation. And there are, of course, borders of different interests, different zones, different organizations that are conflicting this approach, but we'll try to mitigate between the, the, those lines and, and provide the good grounds for best possible cooperation. Um, again, on, on, this last, on this last issue of European supremacy, you know, somewhere the, the, those uh, theories of international relations argue that 94, 1994 was the year that when center of the world trade moved from uh, Europe to the Pacific area. Mm -hmm. And along with that economic domain of power, other domains of power, meaning military, technological, and, and cultural, also moved from Europe to the Pacific area. So we basically now live the century of Pacific with increased role of Indian Ocean and behind us left the century of Atlantic Ocean. But I guess there is not just that historic inertia, but there is a cultural and, and, and overall relevance of Europe still present uh, with the return and re-adherence to those values that Euro made Europe great and, and world dominant player that could possibly be the mechanism of return to the leading position globally. If, if not, if we treat migration separately from country to country, I, I do uh, support this approach. EU hasn't negotiate, negotiated any of the readmission agreements with, with any of these states. And if it has, it would have been obvious how difficult it is and it might possibly reposition the political attitude of EU towards these issues, the causes and consequences of migration. So I guess the interest would drive us, but that changes are taking place faster and faster, faster and we had rather started that uh, mechanisms yesterday than today. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister. Notice, please. I'll start with the fourth question, which is very interesting, whether the current rhetorics and calls for building fences are causing Europe to lose the leverage with countries in other parts of the world hosting refugees. Actually, I would say exactly the opposite. If Europe could work better in preventing illegal arrivals, it can become a more active player in supporting active relocations from countries that are hosting refugees. Europe will have more appetite, more capacity, more strength to actively participate in these schemes. For example, when in 2019, my country had 72,000 arrivals. 
and when currently I have 40,000 people residing in camps, our ability to participate, for example, more aggressively in the relocation plan with Afghanistan is constrained. If we knew that we'll have zero arrivals in the next few years coming from illegal pathways, then we would have been more aggressive in working with countries that are clearly providing this first safe harbor, as Peter described, for refugees. So that's very critical. And going to the third question, I'm going just the reverse order, whether instead of talking about borders, we should talk about integration. There was a very interesting book that spoke about asylum roulette. It's random who comes to Europe. And therefore, we're integrating randomly. And that creates moral issues. But also in the point of integration, I would say that the big difference in Europe creates difficulties in integration programs. In Greece, we have a very aggressive integration program run through IOM, the International Organization of Migration. We provide skills training, we help them with jobs, we give them free rent for 12 months. Probably one out of 10 recognized refugees applies. Why? Because if you work in Greece in a field, difficult job, under the sun, eight hours a day, you make 700 euros. There are countries that could give two or 3,000 euros in benefits on a monthly basis without having to work. And these big discrepancies in the social benefit system, and I remind you that Greece went through a very tough period of economic austerity. We had to cut a lot of social spending as required by the European Union, meaning the part of social benefits were lagging. We don't have free social housing, for example, that other countries have. So integration within Europe causes that difficulty. Closing with the issue of the Western Balkans, obviously, Europe needs to do more in a neighborhood. Western Balkans are Europe. So we need to work closer and politically closer to our neighboring countries and resolve all the issues that will naturally come into our way when we're discussing accession. There's a lot of things that need to be resolved and that needs effort from both parties involved. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think uh, this was a most interesting discussion on the panel. I would like to uh, close this with one remaining question to everybody for one minute. What is the most pressing issue in the migration field at the moment, from your point of view? I think this is necessary for us to keep that in mind and to look forward. Who would like to start? Please, Minister Tsikovic. Yeah, um, I guess any kind of crisis uh, brings to the surface all advantages and disadvantages of the system that is trying to cope with the crisis. In our case, some deficiencies of uh, Dayton Peace Accords and some solutions and interventions done by international community, whatever that, that means, uh, in the aftermath of Dayton uh, showing the lack of functional government. So, and functional institutions of the security system. So we believe that uh, internal changes that are to improve the quality of our security and, and state level system is the most burning issue, but I guess it could be done with good cooperation with EU and the application of the same standards, values and practices that are applicable here. So just, uh, I would say, um, good cooperation manner that will help us establish the same values, practices, and organizational patterns that exist in developed and functioning European states would help us uh, increase our capability uh, of dealing with all the challenges, including the illegal migrations. Thank you very much. Minister Siarto. Well, I think the most important task is to uh, finally give up the idea of the uh, obligatory uh, quotas to be applied. Because as long as uh, this is on the agenda, it will be translated as an invitation in the mindset of those who uh, consider to come to Europe. We are proud that the Visegrad countries were those four countries which were able to block this whole thing to be applied. And finally, I think the bureaucrats in Brussels and some Western European friends of ours should forget about this concept finally. Thank you very much, Minister Mitaraki. Two things in my mind every day. One is 
border protection. The second is eliminating the backlog of uh, asylum application. We've done 75% of the backlog in two years. Why? Because this backlog is causing people to have to stay in camps for a long period of time, which we don't find it right. We want to be able, within a month from arrival, to give an asylum decision and be very clear who's entitled to stay or not. But on the last point raised, if you will allow me 10 seconds, one thing which is very interesting as we talk about the new pact on migration and asylum, we all need to bear in mind that countries that we think we might be receivers of solidarity support, in a few years we might be givers of solidarity support or the other way around, because routes change. And as routes change, we might all find ourselves the different side of the coin pretty fast. Okay, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank all the panelists for their contribution. And I would like now to hand over to the next session to the, our director in Brussels, Ralf Genetzke. He will lead the next session. Thank you to the audience and thank you to the panelists for participating. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much.